Now, I've learned there's two types of people in the world. There are dog people. Those that love those loyal, faithful animals that will sacrifice their own lives for the provision of their master. They will be there for you. You know what's so unique about my dog is I can come home so angry at him and he's still happy to see me. You know, I can, I can lay into my dog and yell at him if he does something wrong and he's just as happy with me as he was five minutes ago because they don't remember things longer than 15 seconds. I love those loyal animals. But then there are cat people. People that sign up for abuse and selfishness. The Stockholm Syndrome of those felines. They keep their owners captive and demand loyalty at all costs and give so little love in return. You see, I grew up with dogs in my house. Love those animals. I've matured. I'm more dog tolerant, to be honest with you, at this point in my life. But we love our animal, our dog, our boxer at home. His name is Boyo. But I grew up with a grandmother that remarried my step-grandfather. Uh, he was a cat person. They called him the cat man. <laughs> you all know cat lady on your neighborhood. Felines swarming everywhere, leaving paw prints and presents upon your doorstep. He was that guy in Elk Grove. And he would collect all these feral cats in the house and bring them around. They would go everywhere. But there was only, after a time, my grandmother kicked all these cats out of the house. But one cat that he found in a field remained. And it was this white, fluffy cat that he named Mutza. So now my grandfather was Eastern European. He was Romanian. So if that is offensive and I don't know what that means, please forgive me in advance. But Mutza the cat was the only one allowed in the house, and Mutza ruled the roost. So you'd be eating lunch, and Mutza would jump on the table. He would paw at your food. I had very little tolerance for Mutza. Well, Mutza also had this habit of, they had one of those little dog doors, but it was a cat door, you know? And he would bring dead animals into the house. So it was a regular game we would play and when you would start to smell the, the decay of a rodent in the house, you'd have to find it. So and we're talking birds. You know, we're talking different mice and rats. And it was always an adventure going to this home. Well, it was an Easter Sunday, a classic Easter 1990. You guys remember those 80s and 90s Easters? They're not like the modern Easters, many of my kids now know. It was a classic, perfect Easter. We went to church we wore our Sunday best. I got PF flyers from Payless Shoe Source. God rest its soul. We go, I get my clip-on bow tie. I looked perfect on Easter Sunday. I'm seven. My brother is four. We then go to my grandmother's house. Now, you have to understand, in the 90s and 80s, we didn't have Food Network. You couldn't sign up for Chef's Illustrated. You couldn't go and find a recipe and compare things. See, you were stuck with whatever recipe was the family tradition. You inherited it, no matter how great or terrible it was. So you'd walk in. This is classic Easter Sunday. You know, your aunt brings the deviled eggs that are just too salty. But over time, you grow to love them. And then you have the uncle that brings the potato salad. And he's really proud that it's real mayonnaise and not Miracle Whip. But there's too much pickle juice and those terrible black olives that we don't know what they were grown on or how they were manufactured. And everybody's freaking out if how long the potato salad has been refrigerated because it's been sitting out on this picnic table. You know the classic dishes of the 80s and 90s. See, we didn't have these festive plates with microgreens and pomegranate you know, pestles on top of them. It was just classic, dirty kitchen food. That's what you had. And then grandma would bring out the ham, but it wasn't a smoked ham. It was the gelatinous canned ham. You know what I'm talking about? No, no, no. It's not spam. It's greater than spam. See, spam was a little small can. It was a rectangular can like an egg. And you'd peel it back and you'd pull it out and you'd scrape off the pectin that was on top that had formed 
with the ham juice because it don't contain 30% water. It's like 80% water and ham byproduct. That was classic Easter. Dessert wasn't any amazing carrot cake. Dessert was Jello Jigglers. You remember those? Jello Jigglers is classic Easter. And you'd make these things and you would wait and they would bring them out and they would pop out of these molds. And none of this artificial, you know, this, this real food color, none of this beet juice and carrot juice. There was red 40 and blue 30 in that thing. And we would eat it and we'd drink high fructose corn syrup just for fun. This is 90s Easter, my friends. But the best time of Easter, after all the meal had finished, we would then walk out, and the Easter egg hunt began. See, now my kids, they have been uh, really deprived of a privilege. See, when they're going to go to their grandparents today, they're going to find these plastic speckled eggs, and inside will be candy and money. See, we did the real thing. We boiled eggs on Saturday. We took out white vinegar. We took this coloring and we dip it in acid and your fingers would burn. You knew a great egg because it was tie-dye and all of them turned purple in the end. That's a good egg. And we would go hunt these eggs. Your prize wasn't chocolate coins or money. You would eat that egg. You would crack it open, you would roll it out, you would eat that egg white album, and then you would put salt and pepper on that yolk. That was a prize. None of this other modern stuff. 90s Easter. But we did it a little different. See, we, yeah, you don't even know this world. You literally have no idea what I'm talking about. Let's pray for Morgan right now. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Do we need to walk through the wounding of your past? <laughs> Easter. You would hide the eggs, but here was the trick. We would hide them outside, but then there was the hide inside. So you'd hide the eggs inside, and we came up with this rule that you would have the allotment of eggs, and I would hide them, and then you got points for how many eggs they couldn't find. So if you hid 25 eggs, and they only found 20, you got five points. I was a master hider. So I would hide these eggs. I won that day. I got the Easter crown. And not really, but just pretend like I did. And it was a great Easter, an amazing festive day. Well, we were tired, and my parents said, hey, why don't you guys spend the night at your grandparents? So we spent the night. We wake up the next morning, and my grandmother is like, boys, wake up right now. So I'm seven. My brother's four. And she says, the, the cat has drug in a dead animal and we can't find it. The house is rancid. We have to find this, this animal. So I get up and we're trying to, we're looking around and we're in the living room and then I remember, I think I left an egg under the sofa. <laughs> so sure enough, look under the sofa, here's this festering egg. Because you know you made them several days ago and now it's been out 24 hours. And it's hot, no AC in this house. Swamp coolers. So, we live in the country, friends. Welcome to Elk Grove. I find the egg, wait till my grandma is distracted, pull it out, and I walk up to her and I say, hey, grandma, it's not an animal. It's this egg. She's like, oh my gosh, get in the trash right now. Take it outside. She said, who left it in there? And I, I came to her and said, you know, I think it was Preston. <laughs> but let's go easy on him. <laughs> Remember, there's grace. It's Easter Sunday. Easter Monday now. See, when we talk about death and decay, deterioration in our culture, we have this adverse response to it. We don't know how to handle it in the modern culture. We live in a very sanitized world. We are very domesticated. And when you walk around, it's rare that you'll find even dead animals on our roads. If you see one, you call animal services and it's gone within hours. It's very rare that you'll see a dead body on the road. If you do, you'll see it on a gurney going into an ambulance. Often the only times we'll see 
you know, a dead body in real life is at a funeral or, or honestly, it's just on TV. And we've been so removed from death and decay in our culture. It's a foreign concept. However, in the first century, death was common. It was part of your everyday life. You would often hear of someone dying of sickness, unexpected illness. Think about this. You would go to the marketplace, the story of the Good Samaritan. That was a common story. You'd be robbed and beaten to death. It was a dangerous time that they lived in. There was regularly a revolution. There was regularly a rebellion. There was regularly those who would try to take advantage of you. You stayed in your village. You stayed in your oikos. That's where you belonged. And if you ventured out, you were at risk. But in the midst of this, you would have people die. And burial ceremonies were very different than what we would know. See, what we would know is the body is immediately removed to a mortuary. Well, in this case, in the first century, the body would stay in the house. And then you would come and you would carry it with family and friends. Everyone would see this. You would then place it, and then you would determine what your burial custom was. We were acquainted with what death was and the cause and effects that happened from it. It was common in that culture. However, there was one word you would never say. There was one phrase you would rarely hear. And as we study first century literature, it was rarely used. It was often described, but the word was not used because of the terror and horror and trauma it evoked. And that was the word crucifixion. When we think about death and corporal punishment, there was many ways that Rome would punish people. But the most grotesque, the most inhumane was death on a cross. It was so foul and so brutal. If you said the word, it's now what we would identify as post-traumatic stress disorder. When you would say it, those images would jar you because often they were family members or friends that you knew that were crucified. And if you grew up as a Jew in the Greco-Roman world, you were hated. You were not liked. And if you had a rebellion that was led, that leader was crucified along with his family and friends. So regularly, Rome would make an example of anyone that challenged Rome. They invented this method of death. And you would see them leave the corpse of those that they were punishing on crosses for days so that the wild animals could eat the deteriorating flesh. You never test Rome, and you must never challenge them. That was the culture at the time. Now, when we look back in the first century, we are so removed from the context, but the Jews believed that Jerusalem was theirs. They believed that the land was theirs. There are three things that were important to the Jews. It was their Torah, what they believed was the word of God, their temple, and their territory. These three things are what they held as sacred. Now, Herod has taken over this, and he wanted to be their Messiah. He said, no chance is that happening. He tried to win their favor by building them a temple, and they rejected him, but yet used the temple. In this time, the first century, we have two to three very clear testimonies of Messiahs or these chosen ones that claimed that they were going to be king of Israel. As these men started to gather together, they would grab different armies and they would grab the favor of the politicians. They were known as Pharisees and Sadducees and they would team up and then they would make their move on Rome to overtake the city. And they would use the prophetic text of the Torah to prove that they were the one in the line of David. And as they would do this, Rome would make an example out of them. They would crucify them. They would break the power of the community. And there was regular unrest. Well, one day, this man named Jesus of Nazareth enters Galilee. Galilee and you know, now, Galilee was a special place. We think of it as a fishing town because you read the Bible. It really was a city center. It was a place you would choose to make the announcement that Jesus actually makes. And Jesus really didn't have much of a reputation. He was a good family man. 
He cared for his family. Many believe his father Joseph died. And he was a respected leader in the community. And Jesus took over leadership of the family as a single man. His father was a carpenter, probably one that would hew rocks as well as wood. And as he did this, he took over the family business. And one day, he gets baptized by his cousin John. And they all hear this voice, and it's strange. And Jesus disappears for 40 days, comes back skinny and with fire in his eyes. And he stands in Galilee and says, the time has come. The kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. This was a common claim that a Messiah would make. People are caught off guard. They've heard rumors that Joseph was in the line of David and Mary's in the line of David, but could Jesus, the carpenter's son, be a Messiah? And he goes into the synagogue, and as he's there, it's his turn to read. He opens up the scroll roguely to Isaiah 61. and says, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he's anointed me to preach good news. He then sits down in Elijah's chair and says he's the Messiah. Well, what you would commonly do is if you were a messianic claimant, you would assemble your army. You would then curry the favor of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And upon his inauguration, upon his announcement, he mocks them. He says, listen, you guys are whitewashed tombs. And they say, we're going to kill you. He walks out and starts to assemble his team, but it's not an army that anyone else would pick. He chooses fishermen from Galilee. And he chooses these men that can barely read. And he says, I want you on my team. Come be a disciple of mine. He then chooses tax collectors. Something strange then happens. He casts demons out of a prostitute named Mary Magdalene. And he says, I want you on my team too. He then walks by a tax table and people are yelling his name and he calls a guy named Matthew and says, you good with money? Come be my accountant. Come join my team. They then sit down in Matthew's house. People believe it's Peter's house. There's some confusion in the text. But as he's there, the Pharisees and Sadducees say, why would you sit with sinners and tax collectors. They're defiling you. They believe that they would defile the house. These are the rejected children of Abraham. And Jesus says to them, hey, it's not the well that are in need of a physician. It's the sick. I've come to seek and save the lost. Miracles are breaking out. Food is getting multiplied. And he still mocks these political leaders. As this revolution starts to emerge, they make their way to Jerusalem. Now, it's upon a unique weekend. This is a convergence called Passover. Very important Jewish holiday. It's when Israel was set free from the captivity of Egypt. So as they make their way to Jerusalem, it would have been packed. A couple million people. Very full at this time in the town. As they arrive, the disciples are saying, Jesus, you got death threats coming. It's not smart for us to go down there. Their friend Lazarus just got raised from the dead. And now they really got heat coming towards Jesus. He says, listen, two days I'll be down. The third I'll rise again. And they're like, what are you talking about? See, you have to understand, we can read scripture with a 2020 hindsight. Jesus was like Yoda with Luke Skywalker. <laughs> he would say things and they would be like, what are you talking about? See, in their mind, this is the revolution move. This is the move where I go in and I get on Jesus' team. Now I'm going to be alongside his royal court. That's the context. So we have James and John. They're leveraging for who's going to be on the left and right hand of Jesus. 
They want to be a part of his royal court. Well, as they approach Jerusalem, it's Passover. So he says, hey, there's going to be a room prepared for us. Go here and make the preparations. And they go, and sure enough, Jesus is right. There's no way he could have known. And as he goes up there, they're performing the normal Passover feast. Everything is normal, and then it gets weird. You ever go to dinner with somebody who gets a little strange? Especially when there's wine involved. And so in the Passover feast, if you celebrate a traditional Passover, there's a lot of alcohol, and there's a lot of intoxication. So they're having wine and, and, and doing the, the, the meal prep, and Jesus takes the bread, and he breaks it, which was traditional, and he grabs them and says, listen. Now, they've had two Passovers with Jesus. They have to remember this. This is their third Passover with him. This bread is my body and I'm going to break it for you. Eat it. <laughs> You're like, things just got a little, little strange with Jesus. And you eat it, and you're like, okay, it's calm. Takes the cup. This cup is the blood of my covenant. Drink it. And you drink it, and you're like, Jesus, I, I don't understand. And he says, one of you are going to betray me. But it's okay. And they, they look at each other, and they're like, I, I, don't, I don't know what you're talking about. And Judas is so irritated, he leaves. And, and they're there, and he says, hey, we got to go pray. This is a strange Passover. And they're like, Jesus, we are so tired. We just journeyed to Jerusalem. He says, no, you're going to pray so you don't go into temptation. I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes to this garden, the garden of Gethsemane, and he starts to pray, and he's, and he's sweating drops of blood. They're like, Jesus is breaking down. We've lost Jesus. And they're trying to stay awake, but they don't know what to do. I mean, this is a traumatic event. Your leader, your friend, your family now, because your family's rejected you. You're hanging out with him. He's, got, he's gone off the deep end. And then all of a sudden, there's Judas with these men with swords and, 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 and torches, and they walk towards him, and Peter's like, what are you going to do? And Peter pulls out his sword, and, and he cuts a man's ear off. Now, here's what we have to understand. You would carry swords back then. That's just what you did. We talked about the marauders. Here's what we have to understand. Jesus wasn't, or Peter wasn't so ineffective with a sword. He didn't like go up to him and like cut off his ear. <laughs> it's not what you did. That's just strange. It's weird. Here's what you have to understand. For him to cut off his ear meant that he was going for his head and he ducked. Wow. The revolution started. Jesus picks up his ear, puts it back on, and says, drop the sword. This is strange. They take Jesus. The disciples know it's over. They know the cost is crucifixion. And if they're caught with him, they carry a cross too. Because guess what? He's already warned them of that. Take up your cross and follow me. It wasn't a morning devotional they were remembering. <laughs> they scatter. Jesus is beaten. He's mocked. They wake up the next day, their holy day, their good Friday, their Passover Friday, and Jesus is on trial. And they're beating him. And they say, say you're the son of God. You said, and they're making all these fake claims. And he says, you know what? One day you'll see the Son of Man riding on the clouds. They said, blasphemy. He claimed you're God. He quotes the book of Daniel. They take him. They mock him. And Pilate's like, I don't know what to do with this man. Where is his army? Well, they're a bunch of fishermen and tax collectors and women. I'm like, sit down. This isn't a revolutionary. He's weak. He's feeble. And they beat him. And they're like, crucify him. Pilate, now here's the deal. The Passion of the Christ, we make Pilate this sympathetic character. He was a corrupt leader. He spilt so much blood. 
Killing a man was just another day in the park for Pilate. And so he says, fine then. You want him crucified? I'll make examples out of your weak. Take him up. Washes his hands of it. They beat him again. Bleeding. He's so weak. He can't carry this stake. They're going to pierce him too. They get to Golgotha, the place of the skull. It was a hill where everyone could see the dying. They made examples of them. And the only people left are the women he called his disciples. Some believe John, who's now entrusted with Mary's care. Why would they entrust John with Mary's care? Because James, Jesus' brother, has abandoned the family and taken ownership of their household and said, you take mom, we reject her. They stand and watch him dying. And he's, he's dead, but they're supposed to leave him up there. They said, no, no, he's dead. Please take him down. It's our holy day. Take him down. They said, we're not taking him down. We, no, we promise he's dead. He can't be dead. It takes men longer than this time. You beat him back there twice. He's dead. He's not breathing. Take him down. We have to bury him before sunset. We can't defile the Sabbath. It's Passover. And they're there. They said, fine. We'll take him down. They take a spear and thrust it in his side. It pierces the sack below his heart, showing that he's dead because water and blood comes out. There's one thing that Rome is really good at, and that's execution. They take down the corpse of a dead man. This man named Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who's become a disciple, some believe Nicodemus as well, comes out of hiding to take the body, and they bury him in the tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. Now, for those that are scholar nerds, we find this echoing of Exodus. There was one weird claim in Exodus where they said that Joseph prophesied and said, you must take my bones upon the exodus out of Egypt into the promised land. And here's Jesus buried in the tomb of Joseph. Very strange symbolism. He's dead. Sundown happens. They go home and have the most horrific Sabbath anyone has ever had. As they weep and mourn, poor and rejected from society because remember he was unlike any other messianic claimant he made all the power brokers angry family has disowned them the disciples are in hiding because their lives are at stake they wake up sunday morning they gather the remaining spices to finish the ritual they walk into jerusalem they go to the place of the tomb Luke chapter 24, verse 1. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And they went in. The body wasn't there. This is a tragic moment. We read this text and we get all excited. Listen, your friend's just been murdered and you go in and the guard that was supposed to watch is gone. The body is gone. Someone's defiled Jesus' body. That's the response. It's weeping. It's hopelessness. Everything that could go wrong has gone wrong and worse. And as you're there, not knowing what to do, as you're walking out, you see this sunlight that's so bright, you don't know how to respond. And you're trying, you're so bright, you get down on your knees because you can't see and you think you're dead. The women walk out of the tomb thinking that they're dead, that they've gone to be with Yahweh because maybe they've been crucified like Jesus. They don't know. And they walk out and they hear voices say, don't be afraid. And they, and they see men in dazzling white. They're there. They're in heaven. They're in Abraham's bosom. They don't know where they are. And as they're there, they say, no, 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 stand up. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He 
he's alive. And they, and they see him, and they've heard the stories. They've been with Jesus. They've seen some crazy things. And they're like, he's, he's alive. And they run to the disciples, and they tell him, and they say, Jesus is real. And I love the way that Luke writes the testimony. See, Luke's this physician. If you hear people, they'll break down the resurrection. Like, well, Luke was a doctor, and he talks about this. No, Luke's not that sophisticated. See, Luke is, is a doctor. Like many of us today would be like, he could barely make any cuts to even bandage you today. Medicine was not what we know. So Luke writes down, but he uses a medical term in Luke 24, 11. And he says, the women told the disciples that they believed it was an idle tale. It's the only time we find this in the Bible. It was rarely used. It's only used in medical books. And he says, the woman told an idle tale, meaning they were crazy. He literally says they're paranoid schizophrenics. That's what he calls them. They thought they were absolutely insane, but John and Peter feel something. They run back, and he's gone, and they think they're right. Rumor starts to spread. People are saying that they've seen Jesus. Peter says, I've met him. Thomas is like, bro, you're so weak. Stop lying. He says, unless if I stick my finger in his side and his hands, I ain't believe in nothing. See, we believe that Thomas is like this weak, wimpy, feral guy. Thomas is the one that said, all right, Jesus, you want to go to Jerusalem? I'll die with you. Thomas needed to see it. How many of those types are here today? You need to see it to believe it. And one day they're eating fish. Jesus shows up. But this is different. See, what Mark and Luke do is really unique. See, when Mark writes... In his gospel presentation, he says this, Behold, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, but he's dead. That's what Mark says. Luke then takes Mark's gospel, which is earlier, and says you seek the living amongst the dead. What they're trying to communicate is this. Jesus of Nazareth is dead, but Jesus, King of heaven, has arrived. This weak, feeble, moral man, this guru, you're not going to find him. The risen king has come. And power happens. And the disciples are so overwhelmed by this, they don't know how to respond. And he says, I'm going to give you the same power that I've had, and greater works will you do. This is crazy. They've prayed for the sick before. And he says, I'm going to pray for you, but wait for the Spirit. And they wait 10 days. They go into this room on the Feast of Booths. And as they're up there, wind and fire come. They're consumed with so much power. It's so crazy. Many believe this. As the temple was inaugurated with power in the time of Solomon, wind, fire, and glory came. As the testaments came on Mount Sinai, wind, fire, and glory came. There's 120 in an upper room. Wind, fire, and glory rest on them. We're now living, breathing temples. Temples, get this, are the only place that Israel believed that heaven overlapped and interlocked. It's the only place. That's why temple, Torah, and territory were so important. Upon the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we're now all walking arcs of covenant. They stumble out. People say they're drunk men. Peter preaches and 3,000 not signed commitment cards. 3,000 don't sign up for the user email donor base. 3,000 don't hope they enter the iPad raffle at the end of service. They get baptized. 
And a revolution starts, and they are there and praying, and all the Pharisees don't know what to do. And they meet, and they say this. Most of these things die off. Guys, let's just be, let's just be candid. Most of these things end in a couple weeks. Let's just hold out. But if it doesn't, maybe it's God. But still, we'll beat him up. So they beat Peter and John. They stumble out. Disciples start praying. Acts chapter 4. They pray with such fervor and fire. The building they're in shakes. But a lot of us don't understand what they pray. They pray Psalm 2. They say in Psalm 2, the king of heaven, look how all of those come against him to break up his people. But Lord, look upon their threats and give us boldness. They believe the messianic kingdom is still going. And they're the representatives. They're part of the royal court. They stumble out. Signs and wonders happen. But yet there's one man named Paul. And Paul's the hope of the Pharisees. Because Paul likes blood. And Paul starts to murder them. And it scatters them in Acts chapter 8. And their little glory boy named Stephen, he brings them out and he stones them and makes sure everybody sees it. But as they run, the gospel spreads and spreads. And one day, as Paul finds out the location of these apostles, Jesus shows up, knocks them off his horse, and he goes blind. He says, Paul, why do you persecute me? You know you need to give your life to me. How many identify with Paul? Sometimes we need to get knocked off our horse. Blind, he stumbles. This man named Ananias, he's a prophet, gets a word. The Spirit says, go pray for Paul. He says, are you crazy? I'm going to get killed. No, Paul's in this city, but he's blind. I'm like, praise God, he's blind. <laughs> so Ananias, scared to death, sees Paul bewildered, fasted, and says, hey, give your life to Jesus. I'm going to pray for you. Scales fall from his eyes and he runs away. The persecutor of Christians is now this messenger. People are afraid. The world gets turned upside down. So much so that by the year 300 before Christianity becomes legal under Constantine, over 51% of the Roman Empire convert to Christianity while it's illegal. Guess what, friends? Crucifixion was just the appetizer. It was so corrupt that Nero aligned the entryway to his home with people on stakes that were Christians. They were caused, and they said that they caused plagues. But yet it was the Christians that go and serve those that are dying in the plagues. They serve them in such a way that they become immune to the plagues. They serve them and nurse people back to health during the plagues that as they get sick, those that they nurse now serve them. And Christianity literally subverts all all the pagan deities of Rome in under 300 years without internet, without televangelists, and without those little blessed tracks. <laughs> See, there's something here that happened. There is something that happened that day that changed everything. And again, I can give you some great gospel proof I can share with you how the Jesus' resurrection was valid. Here's the bottom line. Anything I convince you of, you can open up a Sam Harris podcast tomorrow morning and be convinced out of. It's not until you encounter the living power of the resurrected Christ. Here's the bottom line. 
We stand here today, 2,000 years later. And you really think someone just told some good stories and pulled off some good magic tricks? Here's the deal. If the disciples really put on a good show and said that he was alive and they had this great hysterical group think 500 people, you really think they're going to get crucified for that? You ever see how a magic trick is done? You ever see it? You ever see that and you, or you were wowed and you say, do it again. And you're wowed and you do it again. And you're like, tell me it. And then they tell it to you and you're like, that wasn't hard. <laughs> Jesus wasn't David Blaine and David Copperfield on a Sunday morning. Something happened that changed the course of history. You say, we'll prove it. I'll give you one really good proof. It's actually in the text. You don't have to look very far. It's right after that announcement. Luke 24, verse 8. It says, amongst this was Mary Magdalene, Joanna's servant, and then Mary the mother of James. Here's the deal. The three first evangelists, literally that's what they are, preachers, are women. One's a prostitute. One's a slave. And one's a widow. You really telling me that's going to be who you put on Inside Edition? That's who you're going to interview on Facebook? Let's go a little further. Every gospel writes that the women were the first messengers. You say, what's the big deal? That's normal. Not then. If you're making a myth, if you're making a story, make it good. Make it consistent. Why is this? Why is it that every gospel has a different variation of it? If there's really collusion... Why don't they have the same story? Secondly, why would they all keep the point of women? See, in that culture at that time, the Greco-Roman world, a woman, let's see, Plato, all these great writers say this, a woman's place is best in silence and submission, never speaking. Preached on identity a couple months ago. You can listen to it. Brutal how women were treated in the Greco-Roman world. They were chosen and believed that they were lesser than men. Because guess what? Men are part of the deity. They have the spirit of God in them. Women are meant to give birth to children and serve these men. That was the culture. What about the Jewish culture? They're a bit more Christian, right? Jewish culture. We have the Old Testament. Then we have a period called the Talmud. Talmud's the written oral law. It's not a part of our Bible. In these traditions, you would pray a prayer every morning. This prayer would sound like this. O oh Lord, King of the universe, I thank you that I'm not born a slave. I thank you that I'm not born a Gentile or non-Jew. And I thank you that I was not born a woman. Still pray to this day. And you're telling me these very Jewish men make women the first evangelists? There's not a document in history that has that as testimony. Top that, their testimony wasn't even valid in court. If a woman noticed something, a crime, you'd need two other witnesses to prove that it was true. And yet this is our gospel credibility. I'm still skeptical. I'm not sure how that can be. Here's the deal. We have the epistles, these letters written by Paul and Peter and others. They're all apostles, but yet there's two obscure letters that people don't read often. One's called the letter of James, and one's called the letter of Jude. People would wonder why are these two men in there? They're not part of the 12, and they're not Paul. They're Jesus' brothers. 
James was second in line. And here's this. As we have James writing his letter, Jude writing his letter, guess what? They lived with Jesus until he was 30. They technically had Jesus as their father because Joseph most likely died. And the opening of each of their letters confesses that they're the brother of James and the brother of Jude. They don't even acknowledge their kinship with Jesus, and they call him Lord and King. If anybody knows you're fake, it's your family. And they don't just tell about it. They're each martyred on behalf of it. He's alive. He's here. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is available to us. Before Shane closes with his story that I guarantee will move you, when Jesus starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4, he makes this announcement. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, and he's chosen me to preach good news. He then talks about beauty from ashes and joy in the midst of mourning. And what we notice as the remnants of this gospel story is the first preachers, the first evangelists, none of them had their lives together. These are prostitutes that became prophets. These are fishermen that became fathers of faith. These are tax collectors. Get this. Matthew, the tax collector, is the one that writes the Sermon of the Mount, the greatest teaching on character. He takes what is broken and makes it beautiful. He takes what is burnt and restores it. And unless if you're here today, a commitment card will not change your life. Jesus wants you to make him Lord. And that means making him king. And that means making him number one. Not number two, not number three, not sometimes on a Sunday, but all the time, every day. And that invitation is for you. And that takes place by praying with someone or even yourself. But that's between you and the Lord. But we'd love to baptize you. And we'd love to take you through that journey. At the end of the service today, we'll have opportunity for you to pray with different leaders here. Because sometimes conversion comes with questions, not just a commitment card. My friend Shane has had a tremendous work in Paradise, California. Uh, over 20 different news organizations have come out, filmed it. Here is the Today Show on Shane. Tomorrow will mark five months since the deadliest and most destructive wildfire in California's history nearly wiped the mountain town of Paradise off the map. There's not much left in the Northern California community of about 26,000 people, many of whom have not returned and may never. But there are signs of hope and inspiration in the ruins of that tragedy. NBC's Steve Patterson has our Sunday closer. High above what's left of paradise, after last fall's campfire burned nearly everything to the ground. It's hard to imagine you could ever find beauty again. But if you look closely, you might find it staring right at you. Paintings of beautiful women projected on the facades of ruins, all the careful creations of one man. I wanted something that definitely affected you emotionally. LA-based freelance artist Shane Grammer, who grew up outside of Paradise, says he was inspired to paint there because of one Facebook post, a lone chimney rising above the shredded remains of a friend's home. To Shane, it looked more like a canvas. Sometimes you just know, and a, you know, a gut reaction, I knew I needed to go paint that chimney. Armed with cans of spray paint, he transformed a reminder of personal tragedy into what residents saw as a symbol of hope. And you weren't sure it was going to have any connection? Oh, heck no. Are you kidding? No, I didn't know how the community would respond at all. The response? Overwhelming. Residents so moved, they asked him to keep painting. It did move people emotionally. Uh, it, to me, that was a miracle. Proving that paradise could still be beautiful, even like this. At Hope Church, there wasn't much to work with. Remarkably, only a wooden cross still stands. But Shane found a way. It's special. Something inspirational in the middle of what seems, 
you know, so chaotic. Inspiration is found faded into the rusted ruins of a church baptismal, sun bathing on the side of a hollowed out shed, or spread across the shell of a burnt fan. In total, Shane has painted 17 murals, all with the blessings of property owners. Most so subtle, even haunting, they seem to blend in with all the chaos. What, yeah. What's the decision to do that? It was important to me that the, the work faded in, almost felt like it was a part of this environment. While most of his work is inspired by faith, portraits of women representing a song of Solomon, a love story from the Bible, others are more personal. Watch out for nails. Nicole and Greg Wedig lost their home, escaping with their child, Eleanor, who now looms over what's left, a reminder of their life here. She's looking up at it, at the future. What's your hope for paradise? They will rebuild, you know, they will grow again, they will thrive again. That's really the deep message, is that there's hope and there's life again. There's beauty, there's beauty among the ashes. For Sunday Today, Steve Patterson, Paradise, California. Let's stand and welcome Shane Grammer together. Oh, man. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'm the big guy that cries at Chick Flicks, so I'm going to... Try to trying to relax right now and breathe. Um, so this is home. This is my wife. Stand up, Missy. Yeah. I completely understand that she makes me look good. I get that. Um, but uh, we we most of our marriage we've been at this church. So this church is our family. Our, we have three daughters, and they were born while we were at this church attending it. So you guys are very special to us and. And we miss you very much. Um, a lot of people, I've been interviewed by New York Times, LA Times, Ron Howard's team, uh, documentary crews from Stanford, uh, Notre Dame, um, Inside Edition, Washington Post, things like that. So a lot, of, a lot of news that I've never had in my life. And they always say, the first thing they say is you're kind of humble. And... Uh, and then I say, well, because I've had my life handed over to me. My wife and I know what it's like to, you know, shut a business down. And, um, we, we know what it's like to have a car repoed. We know what it's like for her to sell her wedding ring. You know, I when I, I came to The Rock, I met with Francis, and um, I had issues. You know, I had brokenness, and I told him, and he said, buddy, you need counseling. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and if you know me, you know, it's like, dude, I know. <laughs> uh, and I started this journey of learning how to uh, open up and uh, get freedom and, and wholeness and trans learning how to be transparent and learning how to have healthy relationships and uh, a lot of my testimony is you know my real dad died from a heroin overdose never met him and my stepfather came in when I was two he's a raging alcoholic he despised me because I was from another man and three years later they had my younger brother and my younger brother's his new beginning so I, I grew up kind of uh, seeing intimacy from the outside, it was my, I felt like there was plexiglass, you know, in, in there. I couldn't really attain it. And uh, so I thought something was bad, something was wrong with me. And I, I from an early age, I was a good kid, but I, I was, you know, peace out. I'm out of here. I'm going to go hang out with friends and my grandma and were people that I thought that connected with me and loved me for who I was. And, and uh, so I, I understand hurt and, and brokenness and things like that. Another, well, before I go to a backstory, is there anyone here from Paradise? Yes. Yes, yeah, awesome. Well, give them a hand. We love you guys very much. It'd be cool to pray for them at the end. If, um, 
But a backstory that I, I will tell a lot of media, I have two backstories. The first one is, this was another walk in the park for me. So it, was, you know, it wasn't something special that I thought. Uh, I've been doing murals in orphanages since I was 19. Um, a lot of that through this house. In, in Peru, painted in a church that no one will ever see. Uh, Brazil, painted in a school. In um, inner city, I used to live in San Francisco, lived on Six and Mission, working with kids there. Painted murals in the Tenderloin, Hunter's Point, um, some pretty devastated areas. Um, and then uh, Cambodia through Clayton Butler. Used to go here. I don't know if he still goes here at The Rock, but um, uh, rescues girls from the sex trade in Cambodia. And I went there and did a mural project. And that's always been a... God has always used me to use the gifts that he has given me to bring hope and joy to the downcast and brokenhearted. It's a theme that I'll continue to do the rest of my life. Um, the other backstory is why the woman, and they mention it in, in the media, but yeah, uh, father issues. And when Diane Parnell, uh, a gal that used to go to The Rock, um, does a whole teaching on Song of Solomon and the allegory of this passionate love story from, from God the Father to the beautiful bride who is us, it's really a love story to us. So that, one, that image of the woman is saying, God, you love paradise. You love mankind. You're coming back for a beautiful, spotless bride. And that's also a message to me and my own brokenness and woundings and, and uh, stuff that God is still working with me in, uh, learning how to trust him as a loving, loving, faithful father. And, well, you know, going out there and, and painting this, I... I I have to do that. I have to express myself as an artist. It's a passion that God has put in me so strong. I didn't care if anybody would would ever put it on media or or blow it up or anything like that. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah. And I, I was like addicted out there. I was like, ah, I get to paint on everything, <laughs> and everybody likes it, you know, or most people did. Um, so... Uh, I'm blown away by what God has done and just the story that this is. And, and, I'm, and I'm very honored by the leadership here because, honestly, this is the first church that has asked, asked me to speak about this, which I'm blown away and I'm a little frustrated about um, because mostly it's the world that's been coming to me. And, and I want to see the church get fired up and use the gifts that God has given them to make a difference and to do something. You wanna, and I, I do want to give my wife major props because I've traveled a lot. Uh, she is the one holding the fort down with our family. Uh, she is the one that has also said, you need to go back up there and you got to paint, knowing that I'm going to be gone for five, six days at a time. And so I love you, babe, and you're amazing. So thank you very much. Come on, let's stand up together. Let's give it up for Shane. We're going to pray for him. I see you standing. I've known Shane almost 20 years now, and uh, it's been amazing just seeing the journey he's been on. Uh, he's our junior high director again for several years. We've, we've bled together in more ways than we can count. I shared, I think, at first service, uh, Shane and I would regularly yell at God together uh, in his truck in front of our old building, Bonita, praying for our wives. And why hadn't they come yet? Yes, we did. Uh, <laughs> Over and over again, <laughs> but uh, but again, uh, a man that again when I when I heard this, a friend sent a text, and I had no idea. And he's like, "You don't know what happened." I was like, "I genuinely don't know. I just saw something. What's going on?" And uh, he shared he shared the story. I said, "You got to share. You got to share to our community because really, Shane is an expression of us and uh, what it means to be a missionary in the cultural context in many ways." Um, there's one thing we want to pray for. It's open handed. We don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, but there's a possibility that Shane could be able to paint on the remains of the Notre Dame Cathedral um, that happened. So um, let's just pray for that for Shane and Missy. Uh, you know, we want to support you guys if you do that. You know, as missionaries, you know, we're behind you. There's not a question behind that. I know the church would be. Uh, let's extend our hands and leadership can come up. Let's pray for Shane and Missy together, and then we'll pray as a, as a church. Actually, Bob, can you pray for them? Is that okay? Oh, man. Yeah. Jesus, we extend our hands and our hearts towards these guys. Lord, I, first I thank you for Shane's life, God. I thank you for redeeming him. 
God, I thank you for lifting him out of the ashes of pain and sorrow and dysfunction and sin. I thank you, God. This is a walking testimony of your goodness and your grace and what you can do in somebody that will simply say, yes, Lord. And so, God, continue to bless him and Missy, and we thank you, God, for their marriage, their life, their children. God, we, we thank you that here's a man that, that has ministered so well in obscurity. He's never looked for attention. He's never sought it out for himself. He's never sought glory. He's just simply looked to interpret your heart and put it on canvas and murals and, and, and multiple expressions, God, of the creativity and the giftedness that you've placed in him, God. And we believe that with every mural, there will be multitudes of healing transformations, God. We believe that that's a sovereign thing and it's an anointed work, God. And we pray that you would continue to give him the grace. Give Missy the grace, God. I thank you for her, Lord Jesus. So God, we just as a church say thank you for this man. Thank you for what you've done in his life, for what you're doing, God. And we know that you get all the glory, you get all the fame, God. And we pray that Shane would continue to represent you well, God. In the name of Jesus, amen.